so excited to be with you this morning, and uh, our students on the Lexington campus would love to have taken a field trip and been here with you, trust me. And by the same token, I would love to bust you all down there for a chapel service. It would be awesome for you. Uh, but Dr. Kearns, we're grateful for the opportunity. Thank you, student body, uh, for deciding that uh, the monies that you raised during Blitz Creek, Blitz Week, Blitz Creek, Blitz Week, would uh, go toward the Prison Divinity Program. We're so grateful for that. And I've shared that with our students at Lexington campus, and, and I want you to know that there's a group of them gathered in the classroom this morning, right now at this 10 o'clock hour, praying for you, okay? Now, they may be praying for me too, but they're praying for you primarily, that God would move among us today, and they're very grateful for that. And so, Dr. Kearns, if you step up here just for a moment, I'm going to present you with something. This was a student's idea. They said, would it be okay if we wrote a thank you card and signed a thank you card to the students at Shawnee Campus for their consideration of us? I said, absolutely. So on behalf of the classmates of this group down at the Lexington Campus, thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Absolutely. He had no reason to expect that year 38 would look any differently than year 37, or year 16, or year 26, or year 36. He had no reason to expect that year 38 would look any different as well. It's been the same thing for years and years and years. You see, only after three months of serving as king, 18-year-old Jehoiakim had to surrender the kingdom to the Babylonian army. And he had been taken captive. And for 36 plus years now, he'd been captive inside Babylon. Every day the same, waking up in the same place, going to sleep in the same place, probably very much eating the same food for 36 years. And yet on this day, there came a knock at his door. And when he opened the door, there was a messenger there from the king that said to him, the king wants to see you. 36 plus years, this had never happened. The king wants to see you. And I cannot even begin to imagine what was going on inside of his mind and his emotions at that point. Why would the king want to see me? Immediately he begins probably to rehearse things that he's done. Did I step out of line? Did I do something wrong? Am I in trouble? Right? But nevertheless, he went with the king, or went with the messenger to the king. And this is what it says in 2 Kings chapter 25, beginning in verse 27. On the 27th day of the 12th month of the 37th year of the exile of Judah's king Jehoiakim, Ebo Merodach, king of Babylon, in the year he became king, pardoned king Jehoiakim of Judah and released him from prison. He spoke kindly to him and set his throne over the thrones of the kings who were with him in Babylon. He spoke kindly to him, and he pardoned him. Now, whatever else had been running through Jehoiakim's mind, I doubt that that was part of it, that the king would speak kindly to him and certainly not pardon him. It was an opportunity that had come to him completely unexpected to be called in before the king and now to be pardoned. There are 25,000 men any given week that are, in, men and women, adults, that are incarcerated in the state of Oklahoma. Let me put that in perspective for you. Collectively, that would be the 17th largest city in the state. Collectively, that would be larger than 97% of the towns and cities in the state of Oklahoma. Does that put it in perspective for you? It's larger than many of your hometowns, perhaps, 25,000. It's larger than my hometown was when I was growing up. Certainly larger than it is now, since it's increased in population. Men from, from the prisons all across the state of Oklahoma have been given the opportunity to apply for admission to Oklahoma Baptist University and study in the Prison Divinity Program. And their application process is a bit more rigorous than what your application process was to enter university. 172 applications in that first cohort, 99 applications in the second cohort. We now have two. Submit their information, we do the review of all their information, we conduct interviews, we conducted over 80 interviews, almost 90 interviews with the two cohorts, and now we have 68 students. They're OBU students studying to earn a Bachelor of Arts degree on the Lexington campus. Just like you, same degree, 
core curriculum. In fact, they're taking Western Civ this summer, right? We haven't shortcutted anything. It's exactly the same degree that you would be taking. Christian liberal arts core, transformational education, this is it. Let me share with you what Chris said about that opportunity. A lot of people have been counting me out my whole life, so even though I know this will not be easy, I look forward to the challenge. Here's James's statement in his application. I'm not sure why I'm applying. I've been praying for my ears to hear. The Lord said, all these years I have been listening to lies, lies from the devil. I know the devil has already lost. Now it's time to listen to the truth. Yeah, you can clap anytime you want to, right? <laughs> Unexpected opportunity. And these men recognize this is an opportunity of grace. It is given to them. We're raising all the money from everything from pencils to personnel, notebooks, everything. They don't pay anything for it, right? And so I know some of you are sitting there saying, boy, I wish I was doing that. Well, actually, it's not a good trade-off, okay? It's not a good trade-off. Prison wouldn't be a great trade-off for you, trust me. But these men are hungry to learn. And un not unlike Jehoiakim, it's a totally unexpected opportunity. And the king said he spoke kindly to him, and he pardoned him. That's a great word, pardon. It is a word that means literally to lift up. And let me show you how wonderfully God writes Scripture, okay? He's a tremendous writer of this very event, of him lifting up the head of Jehoiakim, Ebel Merodach. Jeremiah had prophesied years before that he would be deposed from the throne, along with his mother, the queen mother. And this is what Jeremiah wrote about that in his book, chapter 13, verse 18. Say to the king and the queen mother, take a humble seat, for your glorious crowns have fallen from your head. Now get the picture. Jeremiah says, your glorious crowns have fallen from your head. Again, place yourself in the shoes of this 18-year-old king in a long succession of kingship, right? Sort of like the family business. And yet three months in, he had to give it up and surrender to the sieging Babylonian army. Walking out among the people as they were being deported away. Not proud, ashamed. Not feeling accomplished, feeling guilty. Saddened, burdened, with his head hung low, just as Jeremiah predicted. And now here, God, in writing Scripture so wonderfully and beautifully and artistically, says that the two king of Babylon lifted up his head. He restored his dignity. One of the things we've understood about education in prison, it restores the dignity. There is nothing about prison that dignifies the human being. Not from the clothes they wear to the food they eat to the routine activities of the day. But these men have had dignity restored. A few weeks into teaching, this has been almost two and a half years ago now, right? I asked the men, I said, how are you doing? I know it's a bit overwhelming. They're freshmen. You remember that freshman? First two or three weeks? <gasps> you know, what have I got myself into, right? How are you doing? This is what David said. He was the first one to put his hand up. I am exhausted. Can you relate to that? I am exhausted, but for the first time in many years, I feel human again. Stimulating their minds, engaging in academic studies, education, thinking. There are only so many Stephen King novels and videos you can watch in prison, right? They all look the same. Doing something different. His dignity was restored. That's what God does. He restores the image of God within us and gives us dignity again, value, that you matter not because of what you do. You don't not matter not because of what you've not done or did. You matter because simply you've been created in his image, molded and shaped by the almighty God, the ruler of the universes. You matter. And he has sent his son to reshape you and recreate you and giving you a new life. You matter. Their identity is redeemed. Notice what it says as we continue through the passage there in 2 Kings 25. 
So Jehoiakim changed his prison clothes, and he dined regularly in the presence of the king of Babylon for the rest of his life. As for his allowance, a regular allowance was given to him by the king, a portion for each day for the rest of his life. He changed his prison clothes. That may be the most exciting part of this entire passage to your classmates at Lexington. They changed their prison clothes. I, I don't know what prison clothes looked like for Jehoiakim, but I'm very sure that they didn't look like his kingly robes, right? And we are identified so oftentimes by what we wear. And I'm not talking about the labels on our clothes or anything like that, but, but the attire, right? If I'm going to church on Sunday morning, I look like I'm going to church on Sunday morning. If I'm working in the yard and I go to Lowe's, I don't look like I go to church on Sunday morning, right? And as the people in the city of Jerusalem saw the king coming, they recognized him long before they could see his face because of his regality, because of his robes, because of the finery of his clothing, right? It identified him as the king. Here comes the king. They knew that. The identity was captured in his clothing. So when we read this passage, Jehoiakim changed his prison clothes. Don't take it lightly. It means far more than what you did this morning when you got up and put on clothes to come to class, right? It changed his identity completely. One of the burdens that the men in Lexington live with is that identity. Everybody wears orange, okay? Now, Lynn and I are OU fans. We were season ticket holders for OU football for 31 years before we let them go a few years ago. And I told the men, I said, God has a strange sense of humor, Brother Matt. You know, I'm going to stand in front of these guys and, and look at orange all day long, every day of class, right? So we talk about culture change in prison, getting that inmate off their back, feeling like they matter, their identity restored, redeemed, dignity restored. They matter, and they have a new identity. Listen to what these guys said. Eric says this, my life on the other side of these prison walls was more imprisoned and less hopeful than any day on the inside. When I was at my lowest point in life, you, God, saw your child. And when I decided to come home, you ran to me. You are a good, good father. You cleaned the filth off me and put new clothes on me. And now, Lord, I have dignity, respect, and hope. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. That's the testimony. Dignity restored, identity redeemed. That's why we're doing what we're doing. Now, that's the part of OBU's transformational education I love because it's applicable to both campuses. I'm speaking about the Prison Divinity Program this morning, but I, my guess is there may be a one or two at least here this morning that could give Eric's testimony that I feel like I'm in prison even though I'm on the outside. You don't feel like you're valuable. You don't feel like you're worthy. You don't know who you are. Your identity. Who am I? What am I doing here? How can I deal with these things? Well, I want you to understand at this juncture in the message this morning, the same God who restores men on the inside, their dignity, and redeems their identity is the same God who restores your dignity and redeems your identity. You are valuable in the sight of God, you are an image bearer of the divine, and your identity is found in him. Not only that, but look what happened afterwards. He changed his prison clothes, and then there are two things that are said here that, that most scholars believe is sort of a, a Hebrew parallelism. It's kind of the same thing, except twisted just a little bit differently in each case. He dined regularly in the presence of the king of Babylon for the rest of his life. And as for his allowance, a regular allowance, a portion, was given to him by the king for each day for the rest of his life. Did you catch that? For the rest of his life, he dined in the presence of the king. The rest of his life. It was a life-changing experience. What these men experience in the grace of God and through the OBU education in Lexington is a life-changing experience life-changing for them they will never ever ever be the same now it says that he was given an allowance and he died regularly in the presence of the king the first phrase 
in the presence of the king emphasizes Jehoiakim's fellowship with the king. He dined in the king's presence. That had never happened before. He dined in the presence of the king. Fellowship with the king. One of the objectives of your OBU education is to develop and deepen your intimacy with God. Your relationship with God. First of all, to introduce you to Jesus Christ, who is the means of restoring your fellowship with God, your relationship with God, and then deepening that walk with Christ, right? Let me tell you how we do that inside the prison. These men, for all four years, are required to memorize Scripture every week. That's part of the part of the deal. They're required to keep a spiritual journal at least five out of seven days of the week, Dr. Kearns. It's part of the deal. It's daily scripture memory, daily journaling. They're required to read through the Bible every year. They'll have read through the entire Bible four times by the time they graduate. Deepening their intimacy and their walk with God. I tell these men and new converts on the prison yard all the time, stay in the Word, stay on your knees. You do those two things, you'll be fine. Stay in the Word, stay on your knees. It's not complicated, ladies and gentlemen. Stay in the Word, stay on your knees. And if you're going through a time where you feel like dignity is lost, value, sense of self-worth is lost, identity is confused or lost, Guess what? My words to you this morning would be, get back in the Word and get back on your knees. That's when God will draw you back. The first phrase emphasizing the fellowship with the King, in the presence of the King. The next it talks about the portion that was given to him on a regular basis, which does not emphasize his fellowship with the King, but it emphasizes the faithfulness of the King. The king was faithful to make sure that he had a daily portion of the king's food at the king's table every day for the rest of his life. The food kept coming. We equip these men not only through the curriculum, right? But we equip them also through internship. They're required to take two internships before they graduate. They have the facility chaplain there at Lexington Correctional Center is the field supervisor for their internship. Let me tell you what God is doing in the internship. The first 12 of these students, we divide them up in manageable groups. The first 12 of these students are engaged in their first internship this semester, this spring semester. Now, Lexington is unique in the state of Oklahoma in that we're the only facility that has all three levels of security. We're a maximum security prison, we have a medium security prison, and a minimum security prison. So they're all there together, and yet each is separate, and inmates don't cross security lines. If your classification is medium, you don't go to the maximum yard. If it's minimum, you don't come into the medium yard, right? And there are about 1,400 inmates total in the facility, not including all the employees and correctional officers and everybody else there, right? But about 1,400 inmates. So our students are all on the medium yard. They're all classified medium security, right? So let me tell you what the warden has done. God has given us so much favor with this gentleman. The warden has given permission for two of our interns this semester to accompany a volunteer who comes in and volunteers his time into the maximum yard, from the medium yard into the maximum yard. That, my friend, is a God thing changing culture. It doesn't happen. But they're going in the medium medium yard into the maximum yard, all right, the maximum yard is comprised of about four or 500 inmates, all of whom are coming directly from county jails in Oklahoma into the state prison system. We're the intake facility for every male that comes into the system or returns to the system. So that's who these four or 500 are each week, okay, every week. They're there for three weeks, and there's a new group of four or 500. And three weeks, and there's a new group of four or 500. And three weeks, and, there's, and it goes on all year round, Okay. And these men are going into that yard where these men are, first coming into the system, the vast majority of them, and able to minister and share the gospel. Do you know what God has done in the last five weeks since that's been happening? They've led 18 men to Christ. 
We've had at least one man give his life to Jesus every week since they've been in there in these last five weeks of the semester, since they've been doing internship. We have one of our students that's doing an internship. It's what's called segregated housing units. Think isolation. These are the men who, for whatever reason, there's a lot of different reasons, they're isolated from the rest of the population. They're in a cell all by themselves. They're there all day long, locked in the cell. They get 15 minutes to exercise in a chain link yard that's about 12 foot high chain link that's probably as big as this square. That's it. You ever thought about exercising doing this for 15 minutes? That's it. That's what they do. For 15 minutes a day, they get outside and do that. We've had three men saved in segregation unit in the last few weeks of internship. You know how that man shares the gospel with those men? He gets down on the floor, and he sits on the floor, and he talks through a little rectangle opening in the door through which they get their food, and he talks to them through the door. And he shares the plan of salvation with them, and we've had three men come to know Christ in the last few weeks. That's what these guys are doing, being equipped when we teach central to evangelism to these students, guess what? They're required to submit a gospel conversation report as a part of the curriculum and assignments for that course every other week. Every other week, they're required to submit a gospel conversation report. Who did I share the gospel with this week? What was the outcome and what's my plan for following up? Every member of the, of the new cohort that just started, 34 of those students are going through six weeks of master life training right now in addition to their school studies, discipleship program, and there are eight groups that meet those discipleship groups, and each of those groups is led by a student who's been trained from the first cohort. Training each other discipleship. Learning how do we do ministry, and we do it. And we do it. By the way, let me share with you this, the results of a RAND Corporation study that was done about five, six years ago, about six years ago now. Rand Corporation did a study on the effect of higher education in prison. And as a matter of fact, what we're doing, offering a face-to-face -face instruction for 120 credit hours for a bachelor's degree, nobody else is doing in Oklahoma. And there are very few that are doing it across the country. But let me tell you the effects of higher education. They found out that when men get out of prison, and I'm speaking that generically, men and women get out of prison, if they have taken at least one university course, one, just one course. If they've taken at least one university course, they are 43% less likely to return to prison than those who did not. You see, even if, even if there were not a spiritual dimension to what we're doing, which there obviously is, it's the foundation and it's weaved throughout it, right? But if, even if there were not a spiritual dimension at all to what we're doing, there is value in that. For the rest of his life, it says, Jared said, this is beyond anything I could ever ask for. I never want to walk alone or depart from your presence. I long to know the depths of your heart and what you would have me do. I realize apart from you, I can accomplish nothing, and living is in vain. You gifted me with this life. I shall live it unto you. This day is beautiful, not only from what I see and feel, but because of what I know and who you are. I love you, Father. You're the best. You're the best. Now, as we go through this passage, we've seen everything that's in the passage, but I want to give you one more truth from this passage that's actually not written in this passage. But scholars are generally agreed, this is part of it, even though it's not stated, right? And that is this. Not only was their dignity restored, not only was his identity redeemed, not only did he have a life-changing experience, but that experience extended far beyond him. Let me tell you how you see that in that passage. 36 plus years, he's been imprisoned, deported from Jerusalem into Babylon. There were thousands and thousands and thousands of other Jews that were deported with him, living in Babylon, right? More than once, especially early on in those years, I'm sure they were thinking, I hope we get to go back home. I hope we get to return to Jerusalem. I hope God does something where we can end this, this captivity and we can go back. And I'm sure that hope across 36 plus years had grown smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. After a while, I'm sure there are many that thought, I'm never going to get to see it. There are people born into this community, this Hebrew community in Babylon, who had never seen Jerusalem. They'd only heard stories from their fathers and their grandfathers. There have been those who had died 
and had never gone back. And yet on this day, put yourself back there with me. I'm doing my stuff in the markets. I'm buying and selling my wares in the marketplace, right? And I hear somebody say, did you hear what happened to Jehoiakim? I'm kind of leaning in here, right? Did you hear what happened to Jehoiakim? No, what happened to him? The king pardoned him. No way. Yes way. He pardoned him. The king pardoned him. The king pardoned him. Did you hear what happened? The king pardoned Jehoiakim. The king pardoned Jehoiakim. The king pardoned Jehoiakim. And it begins to run like a buzz all the way through the marketplace. And as that buzz grows louder and more people realize that what has happened to the king, that the king has pardoned Jehoiakim and his life has been changed forever and ever, the more people that hear that, the more people in themselves are thinking, if, if Jehoiakim has been pardoned, maybe that means we're going home. Maybe that means we're going back. Maybe that means we're going to go back to the way things used to be. Maybe we're going to get to go to Jerusalem. Maybe I'm going to get to see Jerusalem. I heard my grandmother talk about it. I've never seen it. Maybe I'm going to get to go back. You see, when God changes your life, He does not just end it there. What God is doing in your life extends beyond you. Beyond you. What we're striving for is not just the salvation, the redemption, the Christian growth of men, but their families. If I had time this morning, I could tell you story after story of relationships that have been restored. Restored. One of our students and his sister were separated and went to foster care, different homes, when they were seven and six years old. They'd never seen each other again. 31 years later, the sister reached out to the brother, who's our student, Tracked him down in prison. First time in 31 years he'd heard from his sister. Didn't know if she was alive or dead. Didn't know anything about her. Restoring relationships. Culture change. What God is doing, he's doing in a way that extends far beyond these men. Let me show you one other thing. One more story before I leave. Okay? It's about a guy that's about 6'4". Big guy. Has hand, those kind of hands that when you shake his hand, your hand just disappears. You know? Big. In fact, the men use laptops uh, that we provide for them. And, and uh, he's never used any technology. That's him right there on the screen, by the way. That was, that was him. I think we're up. Right, right, there on the, right there on the screen. Have any of these been up there? I don't know. Yeah. When we were first using laptops, I said, how's it coming along? He said, Dr. Perkins, these hands are not made for this keyboard. Every time I hit one key, I hit three. It's just not working for me, right? Let me tell you about this man. He was a shot caller in the Crips. The shot caller means the head honcho, the big guy, the guy that's given the orders, kill somebody, don't kill him, right? He's killed people inside and outside of prison. The last formal year of education he had was sixth grade. He started running the streets after sixth grade. Joined the Crips by the time he was an eighth grader. Groomed into leadership. Came into prison at 19. He's now almost 50 years old. Spent more years in prison, almost two times more years in prison than he ever spent outside. Gave his life to Christ about 10 years ago. Even after coming to Christ, he struggled with thoughts of suicide. This was his thinking. If I die, I'm going to heaven to be with Jesus. Why would I want to stay here as life without parole and die in prison and undergo this the rest of my life? Struggle with it. Had the opportunity to apply. The chaplain in his facility encouraged him to. He said, I can't do that. Nobody in my family has ever been to college. I can't do college. I've only got sixth grade education. I got a GED when I was 20 years old when I came into prison. I can't do college. And the chaplain impressed upon him, yes, you can, yes, you can. And so he's in there, right? So Dr. Thomas and I are making an appeal to a foundation for funding a couple of Decembers ago. And we're doing it by Zoom because we're still under COVID protocol and things. And I said, I want to do mine from my office at the prison. And I want to ask one of our students to finish the presentation with a short story about his, his experience in the program. He said, can you do it? I said, oh, yeah, he can do it. So I called Delma into my office. I said, this is what we're going to do. He said, I can't do that, Dr. Perkins. I said, yes, you can. You're a great communicator. You can do it. He said, I can't do it. I said, yes, you can. I said, write out what you want to say. Bring it back to me. We'll look at it. We'll massage it if we need to, right? 
So that's what he did. Next day, he brought me back two handwritten, every line, notebook paper, right? Two sheets. I read through it. He said, what do I need to change? I said, nothing. He said, no, really? No, nothing. It's great. He said, can I read it? I said, yes, you can read it. The day came. We did our part. Dr. Thomas did his part. I did my part. I get up. I let him sit at my desk so that he can get on the camera, and he starts. Never looked at a piece of paper. Spoke as well as anybody you'd ever hear speak. And this is what he said, and this is what I close with. My life had no purpose. And even after I became a Christian, I didn't see any purpose for my life. I'm locked up in prison, life without parole. I'll never leave. He said, but then God gave me a purpose. And he said, this is the purpose that God has given me. God has called me and is equipping me to change the culture I helped create. God has called me to change the culture that I helped create. That's what your classmates on Lexington campus are experiencing. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for the day you've given us today. I pray that no matter where we find ourselves this morning, whether free on the outside, free on the inside, I pray that we are free in the redemption of Jesus Christ. We have just celebrated Easter, resurrection. Jesus bringing life out of death. And there is nothing too difficult for him. And I pray that we might all experience that this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.